Well, some of the things I will talk about <clears throat> may be controversial to many of you. Therefore, I want to first establish the authority for which I will teach them. And that authority is this book called the Holy Bible. Now, a lot of people don't accept the Holy Bible because they say it was written by man. No, it was really written by God. It was just penned by the hand of man. Nonetheless, they want scientific proof of everything. They accept everything scientific. Well, I believe that we can scientifically prove the authenticity of the Word of God because of a scientific experiment that was conducted by many different scientists. It started in the year 1835 when a scientist by the name of Carl Gauss of Germany for the first time in history measured the Earth's geomagnetic field. In 1839, he began to measure it at regular set intervals for the rest of his life. After his life's work, <clears throat> several scientists took up the task. And we have 163 years of data in the U.S. Publish Office in Washington, D.C., giving historically the actual calculations of the strength of the Earth's magnetic field in any one of this 163 years. Dr. Thomas Barnes, who was head of the physics department of the University of Texas in El Paso, took this data and put it into a computer and found that not only is the magnetic field of the Earth losing its intensity and extending its line because it is limber, more loose because are losing this energy exponentially. That means fast. This is extremely significant for the reason that it also tells us something about the strength of the magnetic field of the Earth in times past. According to these calculations, the strength of the magnetic field had doubled every 1,400 years going backward. In other words, they take, go back, measure the strength of the field backwards, and they found that every 1,400 years, it doubled in strength. <clears throat> now, that meant if you go back as far as 10,000 years, the intensity of the Earth's magnetic field would have been so powerful that enzymes necessary for life process and enzymes inside the functioning cell would not have held together. They would explode it. No living flesh could have existed with a magnetic field that strong. Now what does this data prove, prove to us? It proves that there was no life, no physical life, no fleshly life in this physical spirit at least as far back as 10,000 years, meaning the Bible says we're only 6,000 years old. This scientific experiment proves the worth of this Bible. There's no such thing as a piece of flesh or a bone of any animal or man being a billion years old could not exist by this own experience. It would explode. The enzymes would have been so powerful. So we know <clears throat> by this experiment they could prove the theory of evolution is a terrible theory. There's no such thing as a billion year old existing because the earth did not exist at that time. According to this own experiment, couldn't have held together. It would have been more powerful than a magnetic star. So it would have been impossible for that to have occurred. Now that was simply, uh, you know what they call that in French? They call that uh, lanyap. You know what lanyap is? Something for nothing. So that was an extra <laughs> lanyap we threw out there. Let you know that we do have proof that this word of God, when it says, that in six days he made this earth, he meant it. Yeah. He made it in six days. All of creation, all he had to do was speak it into existence. That's all he had to do. Yeah. He just speak it into existence. Well, I get in trouble sometimes by doing things uh, I really shouldn't do. And uh, tonight's one of those times I'm gonna try to do something that 
I really shouldn't do. Uh, I remember I, I um, <clears throat> took the pen and paper and sat down. You know, uh, I wrote 15 books. I, I wasn't really an author, I was a scribe. Author has to make it up, scribe just has to write it down. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I wrote it down, and, and, and now I'm writing on my 16th one. I wrote a book one time called Demons and Eyewitness, so I, uh, 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 Eyewitness Account, and Dr. Les Summerall heard about it. He called me up and he said, I need that book. I'm going to Los Angeles. I'm going to preach in the uh, Coliseum over there, and I need that book. I said, but Dr. Brooke, I, I don't have it finished yet. Uh, uh, all I have is an unfinished manuscript. He said, send me a copy of that unfinished manuscript. So I sent it to him. He preached out of that book, and, and uh, I think they have that book here. Thing was not witness account. Anyway, uh, I had hundreds of myriads of letters, phone calls, people wanting a copy of that book. It wasn't even print. <laughs> the manuscript wasn't even finished. So I said I had to write and tell them that, you know, that I hadn't even finished manuscript. And they thought I was lying because Dr. Summerall don't lie. And he said he preached out of that book. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote them and told them that I didn't, I didn't have no, public, no date for publishing because the manuscript wasn't even finished, but that didn't satisfy a lot of them. Anyway, I got in trouble that time and I said I'd never do it again, but it's what I'm doing tonight because I, I think I'm going to be, I'm writing a, a, another book the Lord gave me and, and, and uh, I'm trying to uh, talk a little bit out here tonight, and if I can, and actually, it's a lot of what I saw, what I was part of, and then a whole lot of research and studying God's Word, and a lot of revelation by the Holy Spirit. But on August 3rd, 1979, I was being transferred between hospitals and an ambulance as a result of a massive internal hemorrhage when all my vital life signs failed. The paramedic in attendance judged me to be dead. At that particular time in my life, I had never before experienced any kind of supernatural activity. I never heard a supernatural audible voice. I never seen any kind of supernatural manifestation. In fact, theologically speaking, I didn't even believe it was possible. In other words, I didn't believe in what the experience I was actually having at that time. Because I didn't believe that such a thing could actually happen. But it did. It happened not because of me, but in spite of me. Sometime, sometime there in that ambulance, when I lost sight of the physical world, at 4.45 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, and never regained my consciousness until 7 o'clock Monday morning. During the course of this entire weekend, a tremendous battle was taking place in the physical realm by the medical personnel in an attempt to preserve whatever spark of life was in this human body. I really don't know how long this experience lasted. I know how long it lasted in physical because I was out of it from uh, quarter to five to about seven o'clock Monday morning, the entire weekend. But sometime during the course of this Lost weekend, I had a tremendous spiritual experience. I always believed it started instantly in that ambulance. My spirit was literally taken from my body, carried into the spirit world, and there I was allowed to see many startling truths of God's Word. The very first thing I was permitted to look at was a panoramic view of a living verse of Scripture actually being acted out before my eyes. That verse of scriptures is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It was like a stage play being conducted before my eyes. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness in high, wicked spiritual places. That was literally a description of a satanic, demonic, spiritual government at work. 
There is where the warfare plans are drawn up against the saints of God. As I watched this council at work, I discovered how spiritual warfare is really fought. It's not by accident. It's not haphazard. It is done by design. Everything is orchestrated in the spiritual realm and then carried out in the physical realm. One of the things that I was allowed to see, now first understand my background. When I went there, I had professed to be a preacher for over 30 years prior to that, along with my other earthly activities. I had served as a police officer with the city of New Orleans, on detached service with Baltimore, Maryland, served with the state police for over 26 years, same time professed to be a preacher and so on and so forth. But I had never been taught about the spiritual realm. I had never been taught about the devil and demons. In fact, I didn't know if I even believed that demons were free. Well, I don't know any. And I saw that when the word devil was mentioned, I, I always conjured up that image of the character on that little can of lies. It's got a red suit, two horns, a goatee with a pointed tail, carrying a pitchfork in his hand. That was kind of what I thought about the devil. So I was really really shocked to look at the truth of God's word before my eyes, the reality of a satanic government literally at work. And the second thing they showed me was a skeleton or an outline of a master plan that this council had made. John saw this also, and he wrote about it in the book of Revelation. And he wrote about it in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7 through 9. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man hath an heir, let him hear. If any man hath an ear, let him hear. He's talking about <clears throat> the church in the last age literally being defeated. Read that again. And it was given unto him. Given unto who? He's talking about the devil here. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man, if any man have an ear, let him hear we want to talk about is the age of the Antichrist. A time when we're going to come into that place where this individual that Paul calls the son of perdition or Antichrist. John referred to it as Antichrist. Paul called him the son of perdition. Is literally going to come and rule the world and rule the world in such a way that we just cannot imagine some of the things that's going to happen. And all of this is going to be allowed, it's going to be permitted, because the Bible says it was given unto him to do it. Now, the 11th chapter of the book of Romans tell us the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That means whatever God gave you, he does not take back. They are without repentance. What did he give you? He gave you the authority to cast out devils by the word of God as a believer. He gave that to the believer. This is a mistake that a lot of Christians make. They think he gave it to the church. He didn't. 
he gave it to the believer. To him that believeth, he said. And just because your name is written in the book of life, don't make you a believer always. 17th chapter of Matthew clearly shows us. Although the disciples had already had the authority to cast out devils, they ran across one and the little boy they could not cast out. And after the thing was over, they came to Jesus and they asked him, why couldn't we cast him out? The first word Jesus said was, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. So what do we see here is the fact that this authority was given to the believer, the individual believer. Now that falls back on what we call faith. Faith. And that means that just three ounces of doubt can destroy 12 pounds of faith. So this, of course, is what we have to contend with. But who gave him the authority? Since God gave you the authority to cast out devils, how can a devil make war with you and defeat you if you can cast him out? Yet, John saw it actually happen. I didn't see it happen. What I saw was the outline of this plan. By five separate orders of demon spirits. Just like John said it was going to happen. This book is not a lie. I think I proved scientifically at least that we know creation is no, long, no more than 6,000 years old by a scientific experiment recorded in Washington, D.C. And you know, if it's in Washington, it's got to be true. So, <laughs> it's there. So, um, we know if you have that authority, then how can this spirit defeat you? Have you ever thought of that? He gave you the authority. Then, then uh, why? How is he going to defeat you. According to the Bible, the Antichrist is coming. 1 John 2, verse 18. He's the one who actually engineers the final onslaught of Satan against the world. Now the Antichrist is going to be a human being with Satan himself indwelling him. At the beginning, the Antichrist is not going to know that Satan indwells him. Daniel is very clear on that, and so is Ezekiel. We'll read that in a minute in, in, in the Bible, you see. Now, Paul's terms for the Antichrist are the man of sin, the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Other terms in the Bible is, <clears throat> he's referred to as the beast, rising up out of the sea, Revelation 13, 1 through 10, a scarlet colored beast in Revelation 17, 3, and just the beast in Revelation 17, 18 through 16, and 19, 19 through 20 and 20, 10. Now, they say that <clears throat> there's going to be a rapture and there's no signs telling when that's going to occur. Well, I was born and raised Southern Baptist, and that was a stable teaching in my church. We don't have to worry about no tribulation period. We don't have to worry about any of that because we're going to be raptured out of him before it happens. Amen. Well, I don't believe that no more. <laughs> I just don't believe that no more because the Lord has showed me some different things i got to look at in Scripture. Let's look first at two white horses that we see in Scripture. The first one's in the 6th chapter of Revelation. Chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. Now let's look at that white horse there just a minute. Here was a here was an individual riding a white horse. When I was a little boy, Saturday was the biggest day of my life because sometimes I got a quarter and I would head for the show when I got to town. 
always was a Western home. Always was a hero. And always, with that exception, he wore, he rode a white horse. The bad guy was never permitted to get on a white horse. When I got in school, I started reading these books that my teacher insisted I read and write a report on. I saw that every damsel in distress was always rescued by a hero riding a white horse. There was never a black horse involved. The bad guy couldn't get anywhere around the black horse. It was, a, the, I mean, the white horse. It was always reserved for the hero. Well, this, this guy riding this white horse in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, he looks like a hero. He has no weapon. He projects himself as a man of peace. He has no army following him. There's not a single thing as you look at him to fear. He projects nothing that would make you afraid to look at him. He is the ordinary hero coming to rescue the damsel in distress. But now let's look at the second white horse. He is entirely different from the first. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which in heaven were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Let's look at the man riding this horse. He looks fierce. He has all kind of weapons. He's not a man of peace. He's a man of war. He has a great army following him. And he projects fear to everybody that looks at him. What a difference between the two men riding the white horses. You see, that's how he's going to defeat the church the greatest deception the world has ever known. He's going to be your hero. You're going to give him the authority over you. It was given unto him, but not by God. The church gave it to him. They thought he was their hero. They thought he'd come to save them, to serve them. But instead, he comes to enslave the world. And he made war, Daniel said, with the holy people wonderfully. How do you make war wonderfully? You make it in such a way you don't know you're at war. You think you're actually being helped while your opponent is literally destroying you. And this is how he's going to conquer the church. Now, he has to make preparations for this. He has to prepare for the conquering of the church. So what does he do? He simply takes over the church through his ministers. He plants his ministers in the church. And they begin to start selling pleasant gospels, social tickling the ears of those who come to hear what they have to say. And slowly but surely, the people begin to fall away. Signs of the Antichrist coming. Now, there's plenty of signs in Scripture that we should not be caught unaware of. Because everywhere we look, Everywhere we listen to a true man of God, we hear a warning. We hear a warning. But those warnings are not falling on the ears in, of the people in many of the so-called churches in this land. Several signs point to his coming and his appearance. At least three events must occur before he makes his appearance on earth. Number one. The mystery of iniquity, already at work in the world, must intensify. 
Read this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. The falling away must come. That's number 2, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 and 3. Number 3, he who now letteth must be removed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Okay, let's look at the mystery of iniquity. What is he talking about there? The mystery of iniquity is the behind the scene, out of sight, activity of evil powers. It must grow abundant throughout the world. It says it has to increase. You don't see these evil powers on the surface. But you see the results of their activity. If you read the newspaper, if you turn on the news, if you walk out your house, you're going to see it. Because it's worldwide. So we can chalk number one sign up has already arrived. The sign, the coming of the age of the Antichrist is before our very eyes. Well, <clears throat> what about, <clears throat> say this will. This mystery of iniquity will increase. I mean, it will until it reaches its climax in the complete ridicule of and disregard for any standards and commandments held sacred in the Bible because of the prevailing spirit of lawlessness. Not just in America, but worldwide. The prevailing, prevailing spirit of lawlessness is everywhere. Everywhere we look. Every newscast we turn on, every word we hear, it's obvious what's happening all around us. Well, <clears throat> we know the falling away has already come also. Now, <clears throat> and the third one is, he who let it must be removed. Let's look at the falling away. The second one, the falling away in the church. That's literally was translated from the Greek word apostel, literally meaning departure, falling away, departure. That means moving away from something you already had. You cannot depart from anything that you've never had. You've got to have it before you can depart from it. Now it says the church is going to depart from the teachings of the Bible. That's the great falling away in the last day. And basically we're seeing this happening before our very eyes right now. The church is literally falling away from the teaching. They're departing from it. But it goes deeper than that when you look at it in good. It means personal, individual apostasy also. Oh, now you're stepping on my toes. How can people fall away once they're brought into the kingdom of God? Well, I have 30-something scriptures here. I can read them all to you that says it's possible. Now, I think we tried to prove that I'm basing everything on scripture, on the word of God, and I tried to prove that scientifically we know this Bible is real because it says the earth is 6,000 years old and science proved it. Can't be more than that. Yet during the course of this great falling away, there's going to be a remnant which will remain loyal to the apostolic faith as revealed in Matthew 24, 13, and chapter 25, verse 10, Luke 18, verse 7. So we see, though these faithful people, through these faithful people, the church will remain a warrior. Church wielding the sword of the Spirit until it is taken out of the world. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. This word literally meaning departure or falling away, <clears throat> it literally means departing from something that you already had. And uh, we see uh, this, uh, both the Apostle Paul and Christ depict a dismal picture of the condition of much of the visible church, morally, spiritually, and doctrinally, in the course of the 
age of the Antichrist. The church will be invaded by godless elements in the last days. I mean literally invaded. Primarily to take over the pulpit throughout the land. Timothy, we're told in the book of Timothy that there would be expounding doctrine of devils from the pulpits across the land. And people would accept them. This falling away within the church have two dimensions. Theologically, theological apostasy. In the departure from and rejection of a part of or all of the original teachings of Christ and the apostles. As stated in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. False leaders will offer salvation and cheap grace and ignore Christ's demand for repentance, separation, and immorality, and loyalty to God and His standards. 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3, chapter 12, and 12 through 19. We see... The Bible says, it foretells, all of this will occur. That people will literally be enticed away from what they originally got. This is an enticement. And why would God permit it to happen? This falling away within the church will, of course, <clears throat> false teachers will offer salvation and cheap grace and ignore Christ's demand for repentance, separation from immorality, and the loyalty to God. So we see today the biggest selling doctrine in the average church is free grace. Everything is covered by grace. You can't find a church teaching the word order. It's just covered by grace. Forgot about accountability, responsibility and repentance above all things. You know, <clears throat> this is literally why Jesus said the, the Pharisee could not be saved. When he told his apostles, he talked to them in parables because by, by talking to them in parables, he said they should know it. The others would not understand. And, and he was being merciful by talking because that was one other thing they would not have to give an account for on Judgment Day. If he come out and told them what he was teaching in parables, then they would have to give him a counsel because he said they wouldn't accept it because they refused to repent. They refused to repent. Repentance, of course, is great. And that, of course, is covered under grace. That truly is covered under grace. Repentance. Repentance. But you know, uh, repentance really has... Most people say three elements, but it really has four. First, that we have to be genuinely sorry in our heart. Second, we have to confess it. Three, we must turn from it. And four, we must accept the pardon. No pardon is ever complete until we accept it. You cannot be pardoned against your will. You have to accept it. You have to accept it. Even the United States Supreme Court ruled on that. that a pardon is not a pardon until it's accepted. But, of course, Andrew Jackson tried to pardon a man once for murder when he was president. And the man refused the pardon because he felt he had to pay for his crime. And he refused to accept it. And his friends went through all kind of court, all the way to the United States Supreme Court to get him out of jail. And the rule of that court was, no pardon is pardoned until it is accepted. You have to accept it before it's apart. <coughs> well, we know that there is personal apostasy, apostasy where people abandon God's moral standards. Isaiah 29, 13. Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Many churches will tolerate almost anything for the sake of numbers, money, success, and honor. We see what some churches are tolerating. It was revealed in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The gospel of the cross, with its call to suffer rep repent, reproach from the world, Philippians 1, 29, to radically renounce sin, Romans 8, 13, to sacrifice for the kingdom of God and to deny oneself will become rare, Matthew 24, 12, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, and 4, 3. Somebody said the other day, I wonder when the funeral's going to be. Funeral, I said. What funeral? 
the preacher's funeral. What preaching? Oh, you know, I used to go to church, and that old preacher would preach hell far and brimstone. He would talk about uh, <coughs> repenting. He'd talk about the Savior. He died the Savior. He'd talk about all that. And I go to church now, and what's standing up there behind him looks like a social meeting. They talk about politics. They talk about social injustice. They talk about everything. But they never mention Jesus Christ. So that preacher's got to be dead. When are they going to bury him? <laughs> so we see perhaps they're preparing a funeral all over the world for the preacher that don't exist anymore. I hope we still have a few. Both the history of the church and the predicted apostasy of the last day warn all believers not to take for granted a continual progress of the kingdom of God through the church. Don't take it for granted because the devil's trying to take it away. And he's sick. What he's doing is trying to sell his gospel to the church. His, he's got his ministers in the church. And they're preaching his message. At some point in time in the worldwide history of the church, rebellion against God and his word will reach astounding proportions According to the prophets, the day of the Lord will bring God's wrath upon those who reject his truth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 through 9. The ultimate triumph of God's kingdom and his righteousness in the world, therefore, depends not on the gradual increase of the success of the professing church, but on the final intervention of God when he breaks into the world with righteous judgment. Revelation 19 through 20, and to verse 22, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10 through 13, and the entire book of Jude. A pivotal and decisive event must occur before the man of sin can be revealed. And the day of the Lord and its tribulation begins. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2 through 3. Namely, the taking out of the way of someone or something that letteth. That lets what? The mystery of iniquity and the man of sin. Letteth is an old English word meaning obstruct, hold back, restrain. When he who holds back the man of sin is taken out of the way, then the day of the Lord can begin. Throughout theological circles, that has been argued from time immortal. Who or whom or what was he literally talking about here? Who is restraining the man of sin? Who is restraining him? Until whoever that is, or whatever that is, the Bible says is taken out of the way, then he will, con it will, he will not come in. But he gave us the sign that was going to usher, usher in the age of the Antichrist. And we see those three signs have already come to pass. We're in them. So, it's not really essential to know who is holding back, otherwise the Bible would tell us. So most of the theologians agree that it's the Holy Spirit. Yet there are others who come to the conclusion that it was the conglomerate real church. And the real church, of course, is in the hearts and the lives of the people who occupy the building. Amen. And uh, these are the, this is the real church. And there are those who profess that that or the ones that hold it. Whoever it is holding it back is going to be removed. Not necessarily taken out of the world, but just pulled back. Pulled back. Because it's restraining. That literally means holding back. At the beginning of the final seven years of tri tribulation, the Holy Spirit will be taken, or whoever it is, taken out of the way. And that, of course, is said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. This according to the construction and grammar of the Greek, does not mean he's taken out of the world, but only that his restraining influence against the lawlessness and the Antichrist's entrance will cease. All restraints against sin will be removed, and the satanically inspired rebellion will begin. However, the 
Holy Spirit will still remain on earth. Even people who teach that this brings about the rapture at this point also acknowledge the Holy Spirit will remain because people will be saved even in their doctrine during the course of the tribulation period. So the Holy Spirit taken out of the way enables, simply enables the man of sin to begin his work. Now I want to look a little bit <clears throat> at this man of sin himself. We see him coming on the scene disguised as a great hero to bring peace and prosperity to the world. See, Paul says this, and Ezekiel, uh, Daniel says it. Now, Daniel says this in, in chapter 8. Let's, let's read uh, uh, Daniel's statement about what he's going to do. And then Paul comes back in, in First and Second Thessalonians and confirms exactly what Daniel said in chapter 8, verse 24. Uh, excuse me, uh, verse... Uh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Verse 8, it's in uh, verse 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy it wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hands. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Not by war, but by peace. Now, literally, Paul says the same, basically the same thing in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 4. He said, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction is upon them. When they say, peace and safety. So we see... He does appear to the world as a man of peace, just like Revelation chapter 6, verse 2 portrays him as a man of peace. This is his disguise. He's coming as a hero to the world, and he will be ushered in by the people. He is, chapter 11 says, gains his power through uh, flattery. Flattery. He comes to power by flattery. Now that's how all politicians get in office. They simply promise you what you want to hear. What's in it for me, see? They have an ally helping them. All politicians have an ally. And that ally is a spirit. It's called greed. And he whispers in our ear, we're the voter, and that spirit says, what's in it for me? What's, who's going to help me? Who's going to bring me? And see, this is what the prophet says, how he's going to get in power. By flattery, not by force, not by an army, not by sword, but by flattery. He's going to bring peace and prosperity to the world. Well, that's what we pray for. Peace and prosperity. <laughs> Be careful, we might get it. Now, Ezekiel said in the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel that no secret can be hidden from him. Isn't that amazing? No secret can be hidden from him. Well, didn't Daniel say the same thing? That uh, no secret could be hidden from him? That he has the ability of supernatural perception? You know, one other man in this Bible had the ability of supernatural perception. You know who that was? Elisha. Only Elisha used it for good. See, Elisha could lay on his bread at night and know everything the enemy in the next country was plotting against Israel. And the next morning, Elisha would get up and go tell the king, hey, this is what they said they're going to do. And the king would take corrective measures. Pretty soon the other king said, all right, he called his staff me. We got a spy in him. <laughs> Somebody's telling them over there everything we planned. But it wasn't. Elisha had the ability of supernatural perception. He was able to use it to save Israel. Now, how is this man going to have the ability of supernatural perception? 
You see, there are no such thing as mired spirits of one individual. In other words, a man cannot, a spirit, an angel, a demon, a human, cannot be in two places at once. God is the only spirit that's omnipresent. No matter where you go, to the highest mountain or the lowest valley, to the widest east or the furthest west, God's there. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. The devil is not. No other spirit has that ability. No angel, no demon, no, no other spirit. Yet, the devil had to find a way to make himself omnipresent. He mounted an incredible effort in his rebellion against God. He had to know everything you were plotting in order to do that because you are, if you're a child of God, the only potential roadblock in his way. So everything you plotted, everything you thought, he had to know about it. He had to know about it. He had to find a way. So he did that through an informational network carried on by demon spirits. They are the power, prince of the power of the air, the Bible tells us. And we see a lot of people say, you don't worry about the devil, he can't read your thoughts. I, I believe that. I sure did for a long time. I discovered he, he knew some things I was thinking. And I said to my wife, you been talking to somebody? <laughs> um, nope. Well, I began to search this book out. And I said, if that devil can read my mind, God's going to tell me somewhere in here. I'm going to know that. But you know, I, I already knew it didn't matter if he knew everything I think. It don't matter if he knows everything you think. You belong to God. You have power over him. You have authority over him. Or you can tell him anything you want to tell. That's right. That's right. Because it don't matter. It really don't matter if he knows everything. But he does. He can. The Bible says so. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20. Curse not the king. No, not in thy thought. And curse not the rich. Not in thy bedchamber. For a bird of theirs shall carry the voice. And that which hath wings shall tell the matter. What's done in darkness will be revealed in light. Mm -hmm. Not in your thought, nor in your words. For he knows. He has to know. How does he know? By that spirit sitting in your lap right now. He's there with you wherever you go. He's called a familiar spirit. And he's assigned to you. That's part of spiritual warfare. He knows more about you than your spouse will ever know. Because he knows everything you do, every place you go, and every word you say, and every thought you have. He knows it all. And his job is to report it. You see, that council sitting up there is made up of principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness in this world. That's a spiritual council. What is a principality? It's a territory. That's all it is. It's a territory. Ruled over by a prince. It doesn't matter how how big or how small the territory. As long as it's got a prince ruling it, that becomes a principality or the territory of that prince. It becomes that prince's responsibility. So let's create a hypothetical principality so you can see in your mind what it really is. Let's name this fellowship a principality that it has one prince in charge of it. He is responsible of knowing everything about every member of this fellowship. He's got to know everything about it. Because he's got to make a plan, an individual plan. Now, if this fellowship is too large for him to handle, then they'll split it. So they'll make it two principalities. So even three principalities is necessary. Ever how many princes they need to hold down this fellowship. They know they can't destroy it. They can't negate your authority. But they can hold it to its bare minimum. And that's what they want to do. In order to do that, you become an individual target because you are potentially the complete roadblock in his plan. So every person then has a personal devil. Just like it took a personal savior to save you, it will take a personal devil to hold you down. So now this spirit that's been assigned to you, his job is to search you thoroughly and completely. 
and to list every potential weakness in your fortification. And then, this is re re relayed to the prince, it is his job then to create a plan to hold your threat to its bare minimum. He may not be able to negate your threat, but he can hold it to its bare minimum because he's going, if he left you alone, don't you understand in 30 days you'd be able to free the entire state. So he can't leave you alone. He is obligated to deal with you every day. And that's exactly what spiritual warfare is. It's done by design. He's going to play on your weaknesses, never on your strengths. Never on your strengths. He's going to play on your weaknesses. And what he's trying to get you to do is to be less of a threat to the kingdom of darkness than you potentially can be. You're a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Even if you're doing nothing, you are a potential threat. But if you're doing something, your threat grows by every day. So his job is to get you involved to the degree that you are less of a threat. The less threat he can make you to the kingdom of darkness, the more success he has in the spiritual warfare against you. One of the first plans they have developed is what I call the drowning syndrome. They try to drown you in as many personal problems as they can create. And that puts your energy inward instead of outward. You're not available as an outreach for the church or for the work for the Lord. And you're giving the Lord your bare minimum and your maximum to yourself. To yourself because they're trying to drown you in personal problems that they can create. So you got to learn to swim. <laughs> you got to learn to swim in this fight. And it is a fight. It is a fight. Now, they're going after you. The first thing they're going after you is your light. They don't care if you're a preacher. They don't care if you're a singer. They don't care if you shout. They don't care if you dance. They don't care anything you do. If you go to church three times a day, that's all right with them. Just don't live that life. See, that's what they fear. When you live it, you become a living sermon. You become a light. And they're afraid of that light because they live in a dark world. And that's what you're supposed to be. Philippians 2.15, a light unto the world. If you're not, not a light unto the world, you're not really a threat to the kingdom of darkness. They'll tolerate you. But the brighter that light, the greater the fight. And the greater it is your strength because you have authority over them first to begin with. They can do nothing to you that you don't permit. You have to permit it, one way or the other. And how do they get your permission? Through lies, cheat, deceit, tricks, ambushes. Every way they can but just smudge the chimney of your life. And remember the, the things they use? You wouldn't believe they were spiritual, some of the things they use. You know, like the time you went to fold the linen and put it away and close the door slammed on your thumb and the words that came out of your mouth, not really Christian words, you know. <laughs> Nobody heard it but the kids. And they snickered. <laughs> Mama, don't talk that way. See, that's a little bit of loss of credibility. You lost a little credibility in the eye of the beholder. That's your light. Credibility. Are you really a credible witness for Jesus Christ? Can they believe your words when they see your life? See, that's what counts. They don't want you to have a light. That's what this war is all about. If you're going to save this world, you're not going to save them with your words. You're saving your life. You'll let them see Jesus Christ in you. Otherwise, they'll never know him. They will never know him. You're going to have to live it. What do they call it down in Texas? You folks from Texas, you know, they call it walking your talk, don't you? Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Walk your talk. Be with your life what you say you are in your mouth. And you're light. You're light when you do that. See, that's what that council is up there sitting up there doing right now. They're plotting against you right now. They know that you just heard truth. And before you walk out that door, they're going to try to steal it from you. They're going to try to steal it. Before you walk out that door, 
They don't want you to be that light. They don't want you to be that light. And they're going to try to stop you before you get out this door. And you know what the Bible said in the 13th chapter of Matthew? That only one out of every four retain it when they walk out that door. Only one out of every four. <laughs> Amazing how they use all they got to take it away from you. And they do. They use all they got to take it away from you. You got the truth. You got the words. You got the power. You know, God created the Adam. And from the Adam, the bomb was made. And you know the hydrogen bomb, they fuel it with water. You know, that's why they call it a hydrogen bomb. The power behind it is the energy contained in seawater. God created all that. And that's just a little tiny bit of God's power. Yet if they dropped a hydrogen bomb on Hot Springs, Arkansas, there wouldn't be nothing left here but a burnt hole in the whole entire area. And that's just a tiny, tiny bit of God's great power. You have that kind of power. Yes. Actually, if you could just wake up that sleeping faith, you could say unto this sycamine tree, jump in the sea. And it would obey, the Bible said. We prove the Bible's true. It's real. What we're doing tonight, what we're doing here tonight is a little lengthy and boring, is trying to establish a foundation for what we're going to teach in the next session, which would be a little more interesting, but uh, we had to have a scriptural foundation for it, and we're going to talk about hope. Hope that we have if we have to go through any part of the tribulation. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the tribulation is going to produce conditions the world has never seen before nor will ever see again. Except, except, he said, if he not shortened those days, no flesh would be left alive. In That's how terrible it's going to be. That didn't mean he was going to shorten the three years. That simply meant if he, if he had not limited it to three years, Three and a half years. There would have been no flesh left alive. On but he limited it to three and a half years. So flesh would be left alive. But he said the world has never seen nor will ever see again what's going to occur in the last three and a half years of that tribulation period. What's going to happen? If we are here, has he made preparations? Every preacher tells that will be those who were born during the course of that. Human beings who will be born into the kingdom of God during the course of that three and a half years. What happens to them? Where is their hope? What happens to those that are here when this starts? Did you know, I was just reading a, an article over there, uh, Brother Glenn Shogun and I, about the drought that has forcing some of the small cities in the southeast to close their doors and move because they didn't have any water. They run out of water. No drinking water, no drinking potable water. In parts of Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, and South Carolina, a drought in such a portion of the world has never seen is getting over there now, right now. They're talking about, in some of the places, turning on the water only three hours a day. <coughs> three hours out of 24. And some of, some of the wells is going dry. And some of the lakes, water places have dried up. All of this has happened. In just a little part, we had a great hurricane a couple of years or so ago that devastated the Gulf Coast. Cape. I live 100 miles from the Gulf. It tore me up. $35,000 worth of damage. More than I had insurance to cover. I hadn't recovered from it yet. Lost water, electricity, power, everything. Everything. I know what it's like to turn on the faucet and there's no water there. I know what it's like to have a bunch of babies in the house with a 113 degree in the month of August out there with no fan, no electricity, no water, and no food, no store, no gasoline to go buy, no place to go get it. 
I know. I went there. He made me live it before I could talk it. I lived it. I know what it is. And that's just, just a sketch of what's going to come. What's going to come. I have 12 people in my house. My wife and I live alone. All our children are grown, married, gone. But when that storm hit, all of those relatives from New Orleans piled up in my house. 12 people. And I got a little bit of a How you want to feed 12 people with no water, no electricity, no grocery store, nothing? I did, by the grace of God. You see, I bought some stuff for Y2K. Yeah. <laughs> And why 2K didn't happen, but I had to stuff what I needed. Me. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God we lived without electricity, without water, because we had prepared for an event that did not occur until later. But it was worse than anything they, they predicted. We had a man kill his sister over a gallon of water. He'd been out of water for three days. And his children, who was in August, temperature was over 100. And his kids was panting for water, and the water truck come. Three days, the first water truck came. People for a mile was in line waiting to get a gallon of water. One gallon of water, and the last gallon of water, they closed the door and drove away and still left a mile. People standing there. And they stayed all night to be there the first thing the next morning. When the truck came back, by now the line was twice as big. Same thing happened again. When they got to the end, they closed the door and drove away. Left all the people standing there. What are you going to do? This man's sister got a gallon of water the day before. And she was able to get in the line in front of him again and get a gallon that day. And he ran up and tried to take it. said, my kids got to have it. She said, my kids. Said, you got one yesterday. And it was wrestling over it. And she fell and hit her head on the rock to kill her. He didn't intend to kill her. But he was fighting for that gallon of water. Have you ever stood in those shoes? It's an old Indian. Fable says, don't judge a person until you walk in his track to stand in his shoe. That would just be a horrible thing. We didn't have to kill anybody to get water, but we had to go a long time without electricity, without any store being open or anything else. And that was just a little bit the Lord wanted me to see what it was like so I could really tell how it is and how it's going to be. I'm telling you how it's going to be. You walk away from here, you can never say you hadn't been told. Right. But I'm, cause I'm telling you how it's going to be. If your name's not on that book, you're in trouble. You're in bad trouble because you've got to deal with that world. Your hope is not that world. It's not armies. It's not government. It's not politics. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. And he is the only hope we have. Amen. The only hope we have. He's calling for the church to repent. Amen. To repent and turn back to him. He's looking for those preachers that will preach hell, fire, and brimstone. He's looking for those people who will talk about repentance, come to the altar on your knees. This is what we need. Where are my crying intercessors, he pleads? Where are they? Who's crying for the conditions of this world? Who's crying for the lost? Where are the people in this community tonight? They're not in here. Where are they? I'll bet you there's not a honky-tonk or a juke joint within 50 miles. Don't fool. Overflowing right now. So you see where the heart of the people are tonight. It's not here. And they're not expecting what's coming. Praise God, we ought to be because it's coming. I read it to you from his word. It's coming. And we ought to be prepared for Amen. what's coming. But in the midst of all of this, if you're in tune with God, he's got a place for you. Amen. He's got a place for you. Even if he has to make you invisible, he can do it. He can do it. There's going to come great tribulation to this land because this has got to come, judgment's got to come before the Antichrist takes power. Judgment upon the nations of the world has got to come. And we're going to see it. It's already started and it's going to increase in intensity. The Antichrist is the one that's going to bring us peace. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> The Antichrist. Because Christians don't believe. They don't believe. And they don't prepare for what's going to happen. Glory to God. I hope you heard. Would you stand with me a moment before we close? Now, there is no hope for you at all.
unless you have first been saved. Because Christ is concerned about his, the world has passed a point of no return. We hope that if you are of the world, you won't leave him tonight like you came. You will have your name written in that book before you leave him. All you got to do is repent before him. Lord, I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you, Lord. Forgive me. Save my soul. Try it. Ask him if he won't save you. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come and lift up your name before this audience. Lord, I ask that you take every word spoken here tonight and apply it to every heart that's needed. Let them know the urgency of time, how short it is and the great judgment that's about to fall upon this nation, which is already in sections underway. And it will increase in, te in intensity. What it is now is simply a remedial judgment. Remedial means remedy. It is a remedy to remedy the way of your church. You bring in about this judgment to wake up your church, not to punish your church, but to wake them up. And then there will be a second stage, which is one of preparation. In the first two stages of your judgment, there's room for repentance. But in the third and final step, there is no room for repentance. As Esau sought repentance with bitter tears and failed to find it, so will many Christians if they go beyond the limits that you have stated. Or you said your third and final judgment will be final. Lord, we just lift up every heart, every person that's in this building tonight to the truth of your word. There are those here that might be bound by some evil spirit in their life that they can't seem to turn loose. Some secret sin that they're engaged in because of this spirit. We rebuke him in your name, Lord. We rebuke the spirit in your name. We declare him a defeated foe in the life of any individual that he might be involved in here tonight. By the power of your word, we declare that they are free According to your word this night, you are the great liberator. And we thank you for their liberty. There are those here that's been touched in their physical body by these spirits. Sickness or disease of some kind. And so many people are suffering, Lord, of, of symptoms of false diseases. And Lord, we just declare by your mighty power that they're free of that this very night, according to your word. That they leave this building whole and complete by the power of your word, Father. We thank you for it. Once again, we thank you for Brother Glenn. For his many years of work that he's put in here. All the sweat, labor, tears, and blood that was put here by him and many other people who worked so hard to bring this light in this community. We ask a special blessing, a special anointing upon each and every one. For our family members that are sick and afflicted, that are unable to be here tonight, we lift them up to you, Lord. We reach out as though we touch each one of them. In your name, we declare that they are healed and they are set free by the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. We thank you once again for this gathering here tonight, Lord, and we ask that your will be done above all things. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, Lord, that you will open their eyes and let them see the path that you said they should lead us in. We believe, Father, that you can open their eyes and we commit them into your hands. And last but not least, we pray for our service people in the military. Wherever they are around the world tonight, Lord, we lift them up to you. Commit them into your hands for safekeeping. We pray tonight for the peace and the life of every individual under the sound of my voice. For their healing, for their deliverance, for their well-being. In your precious name, amen and amen. Glory to God.